Today's episode of Transform Your Workplace is brought to you by Zenium HR. Learn more about how Zenium's helping small and mid-sized organizations streamline all of their HR and payroll and benefits administration under the complete HR plus payroll solution. Learn more at zeniumhr.com. Today's guest is Erica Scott. She's the author of creating a consent culture, and she's the creator of the consent culture intro workshop. She's really passionate about helping teachers, students, leaders, and teams set boundaries, communicate effectively, and understand one another in healthy ways. The consent culture that she talks about fosters feelings of safety and freedom that are not only possible, but critical for a healthy workplace culture. And, you know, Transform Your Workplace, this podcast is all about creating a healthy and safe work environment. So this fits right into that. We talk about the word no and why that's such a powerful statement for asking for what we need, what we want, what we don't want. And we'll learn and practice consent skills that'll Help us create an environment where interactions are mutually agreeable for everyone involved. So I think you're going to get a lot out of this. Erica spent a lot of time in the classroom teaching students how to create a consent culture, but this applies so much to the workplace. And I think this is a skill set that we can all learn and, and grow from. Really hope you're enjoying the podcast. Make sure to hit that subscribe button on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to the show. And please share it with a friend or share the, the episode on social media so other people can find it. That's how we grow this podcast. We're just out to try to create value for you so you can have the skills and the tools that you need to help go transform your workplace for the better. Enjoy the conversation with Erica Scott. Welcome to Transform Your Workplace. It's Brandon Laws, and I have guest Erica Scott. Erica, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. You wrote a book called Creating a Consent Culture. So paint a picture for me. What would the environment, whether it's at work, at school, if people weren't violating boundaries and we were comfortable in our own body and felt safe, like what kind of environment would that feel like? Well, I've been very lucky in my life to be able to create that kind of environment for short periods of time in limited spaces. And I can tell you that it's kind of magical when people actually feel comfortable that they can ask for what they want clearly and that they will be received well and they can say no and that will be honored. It creates a feeling of safety and freedom and there's a playfulness that happens and a comfort that arises that you just don't get otherwise. So of course, what I'd like to do is have that spread and create consent culture everywhere so that we can all have more of that. You know, of course, you're never going to get 100% safety anywhere. Right. Uh, the idea is to have uh, create safer spaces and create more safety for people to feel comfortable. Okay. And this is so important in a workplace. Yeah, absolutely. So the title of the book, Creating a Consent Culture. So if the the solution to a lot of the issues that we may have and in, in just people, you know, going over boundaries, you know, uh, that happens quite a bit. If the solution is that, describe what that is. Like, is it a feeling? Is it behavior? It's probably all of those things, but maybe describe that for us. So yes, it can happen so easily. And often it can be because of miscommunication mm. or miseducation or even just different education. Even when we come from the same culture and have this speak the same language, we can mean different things when we use the same words. We can have different ideas about how interactions go. And we can have different levels of entitlement or permission. So for some people, it might be a lot easier to ask for what they want mm -hmm. than others. And for some people, it might be a lot easier to say no than it is for others. And there are a lot of factors that play into that. If people have past trauma, 
that can really affect their ability to say no or hear no. If people are victims of systemic inequity, that can make a huge difference. I could say no to something and people would say, pat me on the back and say, I have, I'm assertive. Whereas maybe if a black woman says no to the same thing, she might get a different reaction. Right. She's well aware of that and has to deal with that every day. So that creates a different experience around being able to say no or feeling comfortable to say no or ask for what you want. And there's also that we're socialized differently. A lot of times gendered socialization is very different. Wrote in the book about a study that was done many years ago in England where they had a bunch of five-year-olds and they separated the boys and girls and they had a nice lady make them lemonade, but she put a bunch of salt in the lemonade. The boys would taste the lemonade and say, ew, this is awful. I don't want to drink this. The girls would take little sips and say, oh, that's good. Thank you. Oh, my gosh. And that's socialization, right? So you can see where that leads to issues throughout life. If one set of people is learning that the most important thing is to make others happy, not create a fuss, not cause conflict. And another set is being taught to go for what they want. Right. You know, success is getting what you want and it doesn't really matter how it makes other people feel. It's a wonder that we ever get together at all. <laughs> right. Well, I know it's, it's, it's interesting because as nice as it would sometimes be, or probably easier if we were all like cut from the same cloth. And this is not true. We're all different. We're all so unique and we're we're brought up in different ways. So it's just not realistic. And it is it, at the core of it, it's just communication. And there are gendered factors. But what I found in teaching this is that it's a human issue to have a hard time saying no. We don't want to hurt other people's feelings. We don't want to let people down. We don't want to cause conflict. Most of us have a hard time saying no. And similarly, most of us have a hard time asking for what we want. We don't want to make people feel uncomfortable. Maybe we don't want to be that guy. We feel that maybe we should just ask for what we think we can get rather than what we actually want. And then when we don't feel like we can ask, we will do something that my co-author calls desire smuggling, where we try to get what we want without actually asking for it or asking for it clearly. A lot of people do that in very innocent ways where we try to make the person think it's their idea or we'll say, hey, we'll ask them if they want to do something instead of say, hey, I want to do this thing. You know, there's a lot of different ways, but it can become a serious problem. If yeah, it sounds like manipulative in yeah, some ways. for sure. Yeah. Let's back up a little bit and, and let's hone in on the word consent. So I think most people would think naturally think of like sex. Yeah. But I think it's so much deeper than that. I mean, it is it is that, right? And that's what can become a huge problem if there's not consent in, in that. But this is so much deeper. There's all areas of our, our lives, you know, the workplace and schools and, like I said, communities and things like that. Maybe just hone in on that word for me and just define what that means to you. Right. So consent is about so much more than sex. Consent is involved in every interaction between ourselves and others all the time. Um, I don't actually call them consent skills in the book, but since I've written the book, I've started talking about that we have these consent skills that we all need to learn. And when we can get better at those skills, we can get better at creating an environment where we're more likely to have interactions that are mutually agreeable for everyone involved. That doesn't mean everyone's always going to be happy, but if everyone gets a chance to ask for what they want and everyone gets a chance to say yes and no, then we can collaborate from there to create an interaction that's as mutually agreeable as possible. Mm -hmm. You talked a little bit earlier about how I think the things that get in the way of having this consent culture that you want, like socialization, I think there's poor modeling from whether it's parents or friends and things like that. Um, lack of like, communication skills, uh, trauma, systemic inequity, you describe a lot of this in the book. And I'm coming at this from a leadership and, and workplace culture perspective. And I think a lot of times people get to the workforce and this stuff's already ingrained in them from all those things that you described. So how do we get from where people are coming from to this consent culture if that's not hardwired into them? Right. Yeah. So we all have grown up in a culture of coercion and especially in the area of business, there's a lot of like you push and you push until you get that. Yes, that's success. Right. And that can be true in business. But when it comes to our physical autonomy, of course, that's coercion and it's a problem. 
So not only are we trying to get people to unlearn what they've already learned, but we're trying to get them to learn new skills. And these are skills like being able to check in with yourself, to notice how your body feels and notice if you're a yes or a no to something or notice what you want or what you don't want. A lot of it is about having compassion for others and ourselves and understand that most people have a hard time with these things. And so we need to be more careful with ourselves and with others. Another skill is knowing what to do when you're maybe. What if you're not sure? It's very Hmm. normal to not be sure what you want and what should you do? Another skill, and this is the most important skill I think that we teach, is hearing no graciously. Yeah, Most of us could get better at hearing no. We want people to hear no from someone else as information about what they want and don't want and not as rejection of ourselves and not as a judgment on ourselves. And what we actually teach people to do is we teach them to say thank you when someone says no to them. And I encourage all your listeners to try this later today or sometime soon when someone says no to you to thank them. Hey, thanks for letting me know uh, what you don't want. I care about what you do and don't want and I I'm glad you were able to tell me. Or, hey, thanks for letting me know what your boundaries are. That's information that I want to know. Find a way that feels comfortable for you and then thank someone for saying no to you and watch what happens because most people have never had this happen before and their mind explode. Uh, yeah, these are these are skills that most people are not taught. <laughs> For sure. So it's probably gonna feel awkward the first time they do it. But it, I'm sure it feels great on the it, probably more connection between the two parties after you go through something like that. Exactly. And so it's much less awkward than just having an awkward silence when someone says no to you, or feeling like, okay, they said no, now I have to try again or push harder. Right. When you say thank you, It shifts everything because it's telling the person, my relationship with you is more important to me than getting what I want right now. And I want to hear about your boundaries. And it it creates an ease and a freedom and it creates intimacy. And so it can build the relationship. And, And this is a lot of what we want to do is focus more on relationship rather than goal. Mm -hmm. I've actually had someone get back to me and say that Taking my workshop has made things a lot easier for them in their business transactions, especially because they now thank people when they say no, and they find that has created better business relationships for them. And also the times when they are just having to hear no and move on, it's made it a lot easier and feel a lot more professional. Yeah. There's so much I want to ask you about just the the learning process and even the unlearning for those who have never been taught this and just have you know, learn from experiences on the fly. You're teaching this to teachers and to parents, I'd imagine. I mean, it sounds like that that the book is written for for that group. And so when I go through school, I never I was never taught any of this stuff. Do you think that you're I mean, you're you're really trying to change that? Are teachers incorporating like even before your work were teachers starting to incorporate some of that into the education there is work being done by some teachers around consent it's not enough but what i find in general is most workshops out there and most programs that are being used they really focus on saying no confidently good it is important but yeah. hearing no graciously is much mm. more important and not enough people talk about that because that's the piece of the puzzle that's missing. Having to always focus on people saying no confidently is really kind of victim blaming. Actually, it's like we're not going to change the pressure coming on you, but you have to get better at saying no. And it really is a struggle for a lot of people. So if we can make it easier for people to say no, if we can make it easier for people to just express their authentic boundaries, that's a huge step. Yeah. I just like to say when we first started writing the book, we wanted to make it for humans age 10 to 110 because really, you know, I've done this workshop with people of all ages and everyone benefits from it. Um, But the publisher wanted us to focus on a niche. And so we decided that teenagers and educators of teenagers is the most important sector that we want to get this information out to. But since writing the book, I have developed a two hour workshop just for businesses as well. Yeah, I mean, in just reading the book and even talking with you now, I'm like, kids are so impressionable to age 10, even below that. But if you can 
you know, expand their their knowledge in this area, they're going to become great adults when they enter the workforce. And so it's like you do this for the workplace and you help people unlearn some of the bad behaviors that they've learned from modeling and, and how they were brought up and trauma and other things. And if you can get them when they're younger, all the better long term. So now that you've built a workshop for the workplace, for probably leaders, HR professionals, and, and they can you know get their employees involved in this kind of content. What are you seeing as far as a response to this? Uh, well, I'm just getting it out there to businesses and workplaces now. So far, I just have the response I'm getting from schools and parents, but uh, I'm very gratified by the responses I'm getting. People say it's changed their lives and teachers say, when you first did the workshop, the kids seemed a little awkward with saying thank you or being more clear about asking for what they want. But now, a few weeks later, I can see like become second nature for them. Yeah. So, And, you know, I do find younger people are more on the ball intellectually about consent. Like they seem to know a bit more about it than older people. But at the same time, they still need to practice learning these skills in an embodied way and feeling it. It's different when you feel it in your body that someone has honored your no or thanking someone for saying no. And that's how I feel that we can really integrate these skills so that they're accessible later when you're in a more high stakes situation. Yeah. So when we bring this into the workplace, how do you how do you envision leaders, HR professionals using this to create a great workplace? I mean, it takes a lot of work. How do we use this? And how do we, whether it's provide a space for people to learn this, um, do exercises and collaborate? Like, how do you envision that happening? Well, I would love to train HR professionals to lead the workshop themselves. And I actually do trainings. Uh, I have done one this fall and I'm doing one again in the spring. And you can find out about it on my website, uh, creatingconsentculture.com, where I'll get you like fully trained up so that you can lead the workshop yourself and bring these exercises in person to your workplace. Otherwise, I will be creating a course online for businesses to tap into. And I do think it's really important for people to experience them in person. It has more impact right. and it's more fun as well. And that's something I'd like to say is that this workshop is actually fun. They're fun and interactive exercises. People laugh and have a good time. And at the same time, they're learning important skills. There's a couple little things I want to hone in on and just as far as the exercises, then I'll let you go. You know, in, as far as consent and being able to collaborate and being curious, like those are key components, I think, to the consent is what you highlighted in the book. How can people collaborate effectively when it comes to consent? Like, are there any exercises or specific examples that you might be able to just share with the listener? For sure. There's one exercise that I call the greeting exercise where they have different ways of communicating with each other and they have to collaborate to figure out which kind of greeting they want to do, whether it's a wave or, dance yeah. or tapping their feet together. And it teaches that, you know, different people have different ways of communicating and also that we can practice that. We can practice collaborating for consent. The workshop starts out with very simple exercises around saying and hearing no. And then we build on those skills. So those skills get incorporated into the next exercise and the next exercise, but the exercises become a bit more complex. And so that's something that I'm glad you brought up because this isn't the kind of thing where you learn it once and you're done. Nope, nope, it's not at all. That you need to practice and practice and we need to have compassion for ourselves and others that we are learning something new and that we might not get it right the first time or the fifth time or the 20th time. And that's okay. We got to just keep practicing. Yeah. That's a, the beautiful thing about life. Uh, we're human and we make mistakes and we're not going to get it right every time. But if we're willing to try and we're curious and we, and we do collaborate with one another to try to make it right, I think we're going to be in good shape for sure. Absolutely. What's the freeze response? Give me an example of that. Thank you for bringing that up. It's so important to me to get more information out there about the freeze response. So um, when I was growing up, I only heard about fight or flight. Right. In reality, it's fight, flight, and freeze, and probably they'll be adding fawn soon. And these are autonomic responses that happen in less than 15 milliseconds, just like that. And part of your brain shuts down, your amygdala takes over, your prefrontal cortex shuts down. This happens when your body believes that you're in danger. So 
it doesn't even have to really be a life or death situation. You just have to feel in danger. And when this is happening to you, you're having a hard time thinking straight and you will have a hard time putting words together. You might be able to do automatic things like walk or even drive. The last time it happened to me, I was driving and I was able to keep driving, but you won't be able to say what you want to say. And it can just look like being very passive. But for the person experiencing the freeze response, you're really stuck. You can't function properly. Mm -hmm. So this is the most common autonomic response to child abuse and se sexual assault. And once you've had a freeze response, you're more likely to have a freeze response again in the future. So to me, it's so important, first of all, for people to understand what's happened if it's happened to them. I know for myself, I didn't know about the freeze response. And when it happened to me, I thought, oh, I guess I'm really a wimp. Like I thought I would have the guts to yell at that guy, but I didn't do anything. And when I learned about the freeze response, I was like, oh, now I get it. Now I get what was happening. Right. And so it leads to a lot of people blaming themselves and shaming themselves because they didn't have the reaction that they thought they should have. Yeah. And it leads to others blaming and shaming them as well. And even the justice system doesn't really recognize the freeze response yet properly. Yeah, I've heard of a case recently where a young woman took her assailant to court and she had an expert to testify in the freeze response and the judge wouldn't allow it. What? Yeah. And even a lot of police and judges and uh, lawyers don't understand about the freeze response. And then there are these ideas of how a victim should behave. So it leads to a lot of blaming and shaming. And I want to combat that. So yeah, I'm trying to get more information out there. about freeze I response. so appreciate that. The fact that there's so many possible responses, like, is there any one response that you encourage I mean, like, is your brain like kind of do to hijack your brain in the moment, but what, what's, what's the right approach if we can even help ourselves there? This is something that I want to really emphasize is that we don't control this. It's come, right. it happens so quickly. It happens quicker than you can have a thought. It's completely out of your control. Your body decides this is the best response to survive this situation. And so it's completely out of our control. Now, there are people like that say the Navy SEALs have learned how to do it or Wim Hof thinks he knows how to do it. But I think what they're talking about is biofeedback. Like we can all control our autonomic activities like breathing and heart. Yeah. You know, you can slow your heart rate down. You can slow your breathing. You can control those autonomic things, but this is such a quick response. Oh yeah, totally. It happens faster than you can have a thought. So I don't know how anyone could have conscious control over it. Yeah, it was interesting. I'm going to be a little bit vulnerable here. So I was having a parenting moment. Mm -hmm. The son was a little aggressive about something. It was probably like a snack or candy or something. I said, no, and he got mad. And I'm like, when those moments happen, and this is just me being a parent. And I was like, when you get angry and you want to scream and yell, like count down from five to trick your brain. <laughs> and I don't know if that actually could work. I remember there's an author, I think it's Mel Robbins, the the five second rule or something like that. I was like, maybe it actually could work for a kid. I have no idea, but his response was not a good one. So I'm like, can you trick your brain? I don't know. Yeah. And I mean, he probably wasn't having an autonomic response, but maybe he was. But for kids, they can learn eventually to count to 10 when they're angry and stuff like that. But you know, he might not be old enough yet. Yeah, I don't know. It, parenting's tough. The ki kids are, <laughs> they're true. like, they're impressionable. They're, and you can, you can teach them. They're willing to learn too. They are, I think they're a little bit more curious than sometimes adults with preconceived notions and conditioning for sure. And one of the best things you can do is model these yes. skills to them too. Like, you know, as they get older, they're going to express different physical autonomy to you at changing physical autonomy at some point they'll be like oh i don't want you to touch me that way right and at that point you can be like oh well thanks for letting me know yes you I know yeah and also you can model it with you know other adults in their life and you can tell other adults in their life you know this is how i'm raising my kids i don't tell them to give people hugs i don't make them feel bad when they don't want to touch someone so please i would like you to be part of that yeah don't do those behaviors either yeah, that's great. I have to ask you this because I, I've been living in a virtual world for a couple of years now when I was used to be in person. Does this translate like all this content like that you create around the consent culture? Does it translate to the virtual world too with just how we're communicating with one another? Some of the exercises translate better than others. But of course, my preference is 
to have people interact with each other in person. It has more impact. I feel like it lands differently and people can integrate it more effectively. Excellent. It- well, Erica, I, I so appreciate you coming on the podcast. I was telling you before we start recording, I haven't really done a, a topic on this. I've done a conversation with about psychological safety several times and that that is in the workplace nowadays. People are talking about it, but not consent culture. I think this is a piece of that, but it's not the whole thing. I think we need to go deeper in the, the work that you're doing. So I appreciate what you're bringing to the workplace and just keep it up. I, I appreciate it. Anything that you want to point people to before we part or just in a part of thought, anything like that. Thank you so much, Brandon, for having me. Just uh, go to my website, creatingconsentculture.com, and you'll see the book if you're interested in reading it. And also I have a selection of trainings. The spring certification training might be something you're interested in if you want to be able to do this workshop with your employees. And then also I have the workshop for business and I'll have more in the future. My guest today has been Erica Scott. Erica is the author of Creating a Consent Culture. Erica, thanks so much for being part of the show. Thank you, Brandon. The views, thoughts, and opinions expressed are the guest's own and do not represent the views, thoughts, and opinions of ZenMHR or the host, Brandon Laws. The material and information presented on Transform Your Workplace is for general information and educational purposes only. Zenium HR or the host, Brandon Laws, does not necessarily endorse any guest, their business, or any organization they represent. Discretion is advised. Please work with a trusted advisor to find a custom approach that fits your organization's needs.